Good afternoon. It is 402, Wednesday, December 18th. This is the TDN Writer's Room Podcast. I am Joe Bianca, Associate Editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. I'm Bill Finley. I write for the Thoroughbred Daily News. Jonathan Green, uh, DJ Stables General Manager. Alan Carrasso, Managing Editor of the TDN. All right, we've gotten through the first 20 seconds without any baseball talk, Ooh. so we're off to a good start. Uh, so we're, this this is at least my last show of the year. There may be one more show um, right at the end of the year, but since it is my last show of the year, we're going to spend most of today doing a year in review because it was such a tumultuous year, and it really, uh, I, I think it's an inflection point in racing's history right now with everything that's gone on. But before we do that, we're going to touch on the news of the week briefly, the big news came Sunday when it was announced by Belinda Stronic and the Stronic group that the Pegasus purses would be cut dramatically. Um, they initially started out at $12 million. It was, went down to nine. And now the Pegasus World Cup is going to be $3 million. And the turf race, which I believe was $7 million last year, is now going to be $1 million. The, off, the offset of that is that there's no longer a buy-in for owners. You, there's no... $500,000 or whatever it is that you have to put up to get your horse in the gate. The other big thing is that it's going to be a medication free race, two races, uh, which I thought was even more stunning than the purse drop. The purse drop, I think you could kind of see coming. I, I think it wasn't a sustainable model long term. Uh, the, the Lasix and the medication thing is a little surprising, especially because it's so close to the race. That was the one thing that really stuck out to me is that we're less than six weeks away from the race. And I think some connections had a little bit of a problem with that. Danny Gargan had a quote um, about how he shipped tax down there early to prepare for that race. And now Gary West obviously is saying that he may not go. He might go to the Saudi Cup instead because it's kind of a no-brainer to run for $20 million instead of $3 million. Uh, what did you guys think about that, about the timing, about the implications of this? It, it really doesn't surprise me about the timing of it, only because um, – I don't know who's really in charge of the Sternut group, um, you know, aside from the obvious, which is the uh, the family, sh you know, squabbles and struggles and legal issues that are going on there. Um, this just smacks of like business as usual with the Stronics. Um, there's construction going on at the uh, at the facility itself, at the main racetrack that was supposed to be done in, in advance of the championship meet. That looks like it's not going to happen. Um, there's boxes that are missing. There's, you know, seating area, of, you know, for the for people that that's definitely missing. Um, and I think that they the writing on the wall and said we're not going to get the kind of group of horses that we want to have down with everything going on in california we can't be hypocritical and say well we're going to change the medication rules in california and not in florida and you know kind of snowballed and then it got to the point where they basically painted themselves into a corner um but as far as the races go even in the press release that they sent out, they didn't mention anything about the purse reduction until like the fifth or sixth or seventh paragraphs in there. Um, there was talk of, you know, which celebrities were there last year ahead of, oh, and by the way, the purse structure is going to be drastically reduced. Um, so, it, you know, again, in, in the, to steal your word of the year, topsy-turvy or, um, you know, situation with, with the Stronach group, um, this is just like, ho-hum, it's the Stronachs. We understand that things are going to get changed in the Last minute um, because the optics, you know, may have changed. Um, but it's not a good look, I think, for them. John, you made a lot of good points there, and I agree with most of your points. But I think the, the biggest thing to take from this is that they were not going to make this race work under the old format. Obviously, you know, be it Mike Lakow or uh, Belinda Stronach herself or uh, Craig Fravel, they were asking around and probably getting a lot of no's from people. I mean, we already saw McKenzie that he didn't want to go. Midnight Bisu wasn't going to go. Uh, you know, so those are two big stars right there that you know, we're going to pass on this. So I think that they were, like you said, painting themselves into a corner. They had to do this. It was almost you either do this or you don't have a race. Now they don't have nearly as much pressure on them. They can have a nine horse field with, you know, they get Omaha Beach and a couple other decent horses and it'll be okay. But I think they, they need to go back to the drawing board after this year. And really, it would be a bitter pill to swallow and, and people don't like to admit defeat, but maybe just say, hey, we gave this thing a try. It just doesn't work. Yeah. I mean, just to follow up on John's point, it seems to me that the Stronic Group, at least under Belinda's stewardship, is really about headlines, I think, more than anything. And I say that, no, I say that admitting that what they're doing in California in order to cut down a medication and make things safer. I think they are, there are some good substantive things that are going on that they spearheaded. 
But in terms of this, like you said, for them to not even mention the purse reduction until the fifth paragraph, they knew that that was going to be a negative headline. So it seems like at the last second they threw in, okay, it's going to be Lasix free. So then there's the positive headline up top, and then you get later in the press release and you realize that, hey, this is a completely different race now than it used to be. So I, I agree with that, and I take your point that this just – it seems like a, a PR move trying to put lipstick on a pig because a lot of people, you know, have shipped and pointed to this race thinking it was going to be a certain purse level. And it's not slightly redu- reduced. It's drastically reduced. So it's a completely different event now. And I just, it, if this was really the plan, it could have been communicated a lot earlier. And like you, like you guys said, this was inevitable because the old structure wasn't going to work. But for them to spring this on people in mid-December, I, it's not, not good. So I kind of found myself wondering exactly at what point or what, if any, conversations they the, they had with connections that were thinking about it with with Rick Porter or with the Wests, um, with um, GM, the GMB racing people. Just, uh, just to interrupt you, yeah. they're, Wests are probably too busy with the pending suits against uh, Joe here. So <laughs> that, that's probably why they didn't return their call in, in, you know, in, in all due respect to, uh, to the Stronach group. I got a good lawyer. <laughs> Sorry, Alan. Go ahead. I interrupted you. So from that perspective, I think it's, a, um, it's another public relations nightmare for, for the Stronach group. Um, it just, it just just trying to play catch up and, and trying to make the best out of a, out of a bad situation it's going to be a three million dollar race. That's that's not peanuts, but three million is not twenty million. Uh, three three million is not twelve million, and so there's going to be um, some fallout from that, which I suppose they expect. So we'll see what happens. I just you know, it's another black eye for for uh, the Strongman Group. Yeah, I mean, it's it's it, it was not well handled. I think, like I said, inevitably this was the way it was going to go, but it was was not well handled. And I think a lot of pressure was put on with the Saudi Cup and, you know, having a $20 million race and then a $10 million race a month or two later, uh, it just, it wasn't going to be able to compete long term and now it's going to be able to compete even less. And, you know, like you guys said, it's it's still going to be a nice race. You're still going to get a couple of good horses who don't want to ship overseas for whatever reason. But I think the days of the Pegasus being a circle date on the calendar for a lot of people have come and gone. And what was it? Only three years. So you got to feel good if you're, uh, if, if you were interested in, and had interest in Arrogate or Gunrunner or City of Light because you got in while the getting's good. And now it's going to fade into the background of the calendar, I think. The other news from this week, actually from earlier today, uh, it was, it was reported among other people by Bill Finley and the TDN that. Stormy Liberal, we had this discussion last week where it seemed that the horse was getting kind of tossed around, you know, as collateral damage in a personal dispute between David Bernson and Peter Miller. It was reported today that they are going to retire Stormy Liberal. Um, He's going to go to Old Friends in Kentucky. And supposedly they had the horse shipped to Ocala as they said they would. He came up, he came back with some fetlock damage, I believe, and it just, it didn't, they said he needed a six to eight month recovery period. So it was not going to be worth it to bring him back. So I, I, I we were a little hard on the, the connections last week. So we, we do want to applaud them for doing the right thing with this horse. You know, we, we spent a lot of time on this podcast, you know, haranguing people for not doing the right thing. So I think it's only fair when they do do what's good for racing and what's good for the optics of the sport. They are to be applauded. And it's, it's good that Stormy Love will, will live out the rest of his days at old friends. So we're happy about that. Well, we didn't know much about David Bernson before this issue came up. He was an owner that sort of was always in the background. And I I think the end result is he's not an unreasonable person because no reasonable person would have continued to race this horse. First of all, from just a purely economic standpoint, you're probably looking at a horse that might be able to win a $50,000 claimer if he ran back to his 2019 form. And but big, the bigger picture is, of course, the climate of racing these days, the intense scrutiny it's under. And I brought this up in what I wrote in the TDN. You know, obviously, the chances of the horse breaking down a race, if he were to run next year, are very slim. But if it happened, you know, again, you think Mongolian groom was a bad story? Oh, my goodness. And, you know, he couldn't have put himself, unless he was a real irrational person, he never would have put himself 
in a position where he would be the most vilified person in the history of the racing and 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 create a situation where racing is going to have to defend itself still again. Oh boy, these greedy owners brought this eight-year-old back and to squeeze another penny out of him and look what happened. So, you know, good for David Bernson. In the end, he didn't do anything wrong. No harm, no foul. And we can move on. Yeah, and the thing is, you know, it's not fair. I think you've touched on this in your reporting on it, that it's not fair that he should have to carry the burden of the entire sport, but that's where we are now. That's where we are, that anybody who's in any – everybody has to be a steward of racing now, and especially the people that are making decisions at the very top, you know, in, in terms of racetrack management, in terms of owners. These people have these decisions to make, and they have to take into account the grand scheme of things and the position that racing's in. And that's not totally fair because ideal in an ideal world, you'd be able to do whatever you want. It's your horse. It's your property. But at this point – you have to you have to take a step back and think about the effect that these things have from a PR perspective. And I I'm not going to say that that's what they did here. You know, the horse obviously did have his issues, but I, w- I would hope that at least after all the reporting and all the blow up of the last week that David Bernson did take a bit of a step back and think about things on a larger scale. And so that's that's the hope that going forward in 2020, people realize not to be so short sighted with these animals that. We're all on notice now. Everybody in this sport is on notice, and business as usual isn't going to cut it anymore. And there's not going to be any quiet breakdowns or you know quiet getting rid of horses or drugging horses or anything. It's never going to be quiet again. It's never going to be brushed under the rug again. This is a time of racing in the spotlight for good or for bad. And we got we got to cut out a lot of the bad stuff. And it's it, it's incumbent upon people who have these decisions in their purview, who have these decisions to make about these horses. I wonder what Carl Broberg thinks. Interesting point. Carl Why? Broberg. Well, his tweet from a few days ago. I didn't see. That. Oh, I missed that. Oh, wow. Yeah. What do you say? Find it something along the lines of, "Tell Mr. Burnson to send him." To us, we'll win some stakes at Sam Houston or something like that. Oh, so. well, that's a big surprise. Um, with the guy who wins 5,000 races a year and, and has this for sale sign on his silks, that's a big <laughs> surprise that he thought he could get a couple more well, bucks out of this horse. The only thing I want to add is I, I thought that Burnson kind of got a raw deal from the from the get-go. I think everybody saw him as um, equally culpable or, or maybe the bigger of two evils or something like that. Um, and he expressed that his concern was the horse. They were going to get him to Dave Scanlon, have him checked out, and then he would make the right decision. So that's in the, that, that, that's what ended up happening. I just think he took um, probably a little too much crap at the beginning. But I would, I'm agree, glad, I'm glad I, it I would agree with that. And I, I feel like I, may, I might have contributed to that a little bit last week when we didn't have the entire picture. So I, I'll, I'll apologize for that. But in the end, the, the, the only thing that matters is that the right thing was done for the horse. And whoever's the good guy or the bad guy in here, in the end, it was a positive result for the animal. And that's the most important thing. You know, Joe, I totally agree with you. And But, you know, let's look at it from a bigger picture here. Is that, you know, 10, 15 years ago, an owner might have said, you know, the hell with you. Hell with the people that are telling me I'm doing the wrong. I'm just going to run the horse anyways. So in the end, the right thing happened. I think we all agree. And maybe that you can look at that as a positive in the, you know, ever – moving forward nature of the sport or what we hope is the moving forward nature of the sport that people are now really do understand like you said we're all in this together we've got to do the right thing this was a a very 2019 move that might not have been made in two um well let's go back even further uh 1989 or something like that yeah and i i think we can that's a good segue i think for our year in review because the the overarching theme of this entire year in racing was the safety issue and the it obviously started at the beginning of the year with Santa Anita and the rash of breakdowns that they had and I think what's kind of gotten lost in this is that after the first month or two they got their they got their house in order and I think that the breakdown rate beyond like those first couple of months of the year was pretty much in line with most tracks around the country but the problem is they had let it get to a point where it became a crisis and then they weren't able to put that genie back in the bottle. So now it became every time a horse breaks down, it's considered a, you know, an abnormal event that shouldn't be happening. And obviously none of us want any horses to break down, but it's never, it's never going to be a 0% fatality rate. So I think that this was a PR crisis just as much as anything. And that the, 
the powers that be in Santa Anita and California racing weren't proactive enough in the early stages of this issue, and they paid the price for it. And I think unfairly so in a lot of cases, because I think Santa Anita has done a lot and taken a lot of steps to make things better and make things easier on the horses. I mean, look no further than the Breeders' Cup, where they slowed that track down to a beach, which is something that you never, ever used to see at Santa Anita, especially when they had the Breeders' Cup. If anything, they would speed up the track, and it would be a highway. So I think Santa Anita has, deserves a lot of credit for that and for really taking steps to reverse this trend. But this was... This was something that should have been handled better from the jump. I don't care if, whether it was suspending racing, suspending trainers, you know, tearing up the track. And they eventually did do some of that. But this was something that spiraled and spiraled very quickly. And I want to open the floor to you guys. Basic question is where racing was at earlier in the year, where it is now, where do you feel it's going to go in 2020 and beyond? Do you think we're on the right trajectory? Yeah, I, I mean, Joe, you, you were very eloquent with, with with the intro, and I think that it's not just the horse industry that's uh, that's on notice. And Alan used a very important word, which is culpability um, and accountability. And you know, you're seeing it in entertainment, you're seeing it in business, you're seeing it in uh, the ecosystem and the climate where it's not business as usual. You can't do things the way that they've been done before because everybody is under a microscope um, now, and the horse industry included. And you know, I remember when we first started these podcasts in September in October and we were banging on the table about all the changes that need to be done. As a matter of fact, one of the immediate questions was, what would you fix in racing? What was the first thing you'd fix in racing? And I think the majority of us were safety issues. You're trying to make sure that the athletes were in a safer environment uh, or better or better environment, that the tracks were safer, that there were things that were going to be done um, medically and cosmetically to make sure that they were going to be, um, you know, in, in, a, in a safer uh, work environment. And those things are starting to come to fruition. Um, so that's a positive thing. There's still a lot of ways to go. And, and I'm glad to see that owners and trainers and, and, and breeders are all kind of under the same microscope um, because this time last year, the industry was still very splintered and uh, there was still no culpability uh, requirement. There was still, it's still not regulated industry um, and there are still a lot of things that need to be changed, but it looks like that the momentum, the pendulum is starting to go in the right direction, that things are going to be better. Uh, that being said, there's still a lot more that needs to be done with regard to what do you do with these athletes when they are hurt or they are no longer um, viable investments um, on the racetrack? It can't just be, well, we're going to send them to Mountaineer Park or Kalamazoo or any other you know, secondary racetrack and drop them down to $4,000 and let it be somebody else's problem. Um, but there needs to be you know, an eventual um, vehicle for them to ultimately retire to. Um, because even Stormy Liberal, I, I, the, the rumors were that, um, you know, where, where that horse retired, there's a one-year waiting list to get in. Well, that can't be the way. So there's, if we're producing twenty or 25,000 foals a year, there has to be a depository where we retire these horses and, they, and it's not that they go to the killers or that they're forgotten about. Um, and, and I would like to see you know, that happen in 2020 or 2021 is um, that there's another opportunity for these horses to retire and, uh, and have a good you know, life or be rehabilitated to become you know, something else to be a viable you know, asset for, um, you know, for a group or for themselves. Yeah, and, and just before – you guys, all great points just before you guys go. Uh, I wanted to mention one more thing about the Pegasus. Uh, it was reported in that press release by Belinda Stronach that I think 2% of the purses from the two races are going to go to aftercare, which is $80,000, not, you know, a ton of money in the grand scheme of things in terms of the, uh, you know, the, the magnitude of the issue. But I just I wanted to mention that, too, because, you know, even even nakedly positive PR moves can be, you know, beneficial. But, but that'll get reduced to three years. So. <laughs> yeah, it'll cut it half, 75 percent. Right. <laughs> um, Joe, my take on this uh, is that we don't really know the answer yet so far as many of the questions that you brought up. And the problem racing has is is not going to change and will not change pro possibly for the, from here to the end of time is that it's under a microscope. So now, like you said. The breakdown rate at Santa Anita is more on par with every race, other racetrack in the country. But still, you're going to get, when they open on December 26th, unfortunately, within a week or two, a horse will break down and die. And then, you know, the people are going to be out with their signs again and screaming and yelling. Pete is going to put out a press release and whatnot. I do sense that uh, 
there's a little less pressure on the game now than there was uh, a couple of weeks ago. You know, we, and Greg Ferraro said some of these things when we had him on the podcast. I think for one thing, I think the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, has agreed maybe behind closed doors, but it seems like this is the way they're going, that he's going to allow racing to hit the reset button. Okay, terrible time. You say you're going to fix things. I'm going to back off. Let's see what happens. But we are also in a situation where, again, if anything like what happens at, happens at Santa Anita happens again at Santa Anita, or if there's a breakdown in, in one of the Triple Crown races or something like that, you know, it's this the hysteria is going to start all over again. So what racing needs in 2020 is a lot of luck. Mm-hmm. It was uh, interesting, obviously, at Del Mar when they canceled those few meets when they knew the rain was coming. Um, interestingly, Andy Asaro tweeted the long-term or – near-term weather forecast for Arcadia for next week, which calls for a bunch of rain the first couple, three days, including the La Brea and the Malibu. So it'll be interesting to see um, how track officials handle that potential dilemma. I think I've always been critical of racing as being reactive and never proactive. So from my perspective, the steps that have been taken in terms of medication reform or, or at least adjusting the policies in a small sort of way. Um, The PET scan machines, this new technology that's being introduced in California, um, the bio, the the biomarkers, the report that Dan Ross had about the shockwave therapy and potential biomarkers. I think all that is interesting and augurs well. Um, And, and, you know, not that it's going to solve every one of racing's problems, but it's good to seeing, it's good seeing it, being addressed, um, and, and trying to take a proactive approach. I guess I'm optimistic. I'm always a glass half full kind of guy anyways, but I'm going to keep my fingers crossed. Racing had a come to Jesus moment this year. And I think that it, it honestly was too late. It, I'm not saying too late in terms of saving the sport, but too late in terms of this should have been addressed. These, these kind of issues should have been addressed way earlier. It shouldn't have taken this big of a scandal to put the horse's safety first. But it's better late than never. And I think I mean, I've said this on the podcast before when I was talking about how it could have been a complete catastrophe if there had been a pile up in the derby. And I think honestly would have been the end of the sport that because that didn't happen, racing has a chance to correct course and to go in the right direction and improve going forward and really, you know, rehabilitate its image because that's what's needed right now. And honestly, it's fun. It's it's funny. Funny is maybe the wrong word, but it's. I guess I'll say amusing. It's amusing that we used, I feel like I and the rest of racing fans used to be begging for the mainstream media to cover racing. Like it would be so cool. Like when there was a triple crown on the line and all the main, the major news outlets would, would come and cover it. I was like, yes, someone's finally paying attention to us. And now it's like, please don't report about us. Please don't put us in the newspaper because it's almost all been bad. And I think that racing has to kind of reckon with the fact that, it, if they do do the right things and if they do have improved safety going forward, that's not going to get those kind of headlines. That's going to be a slow burn and maybe there will be some thick pieces in the future about how racing got to this inflection point and turned it in the right direction. But I think people got to got to realize that, you know, as much as we would want like the thoroughbred safety coalition and the breakdown free meet at Del Mar, we want these things to be front and center. It's not that if it bleeds, it leads like this stuff is not going to be reported on. You got to do it anyway. You got to do it anyway, because this drumbeat of horses breaking down and the public outrage, I I agree with you guys that it it has ceased at least a little bit. It will pick right back up if racing doesn't get its house in order. Joe, again, all very good points. I agree with you 100 percent on everything you said. But I want to go back to when we first brought the subject up. My answer was we don't know. And to a, another thought came into my little brain while you were talking is that what we don't know and what is very scary is will the animal rights community ever accept that any horses die? And we don't know that yet. So, you know, if, if they have the greatest safety record in the history of Santa Anita and only one horse breaks down and dies during that long meet, will their take be, isn't this great that Santa Anita cut down so much on the deaths? Or would it be that on April 17th, 2020, a horse died at Santa Anita? And I'm a little worried that it's the latter. And if, if it is going to be the latter where they find deaths unacceptable, then this whole thing is going to boil over again. And it's, you know, might get really ugly 
again, like I mentioned, if there's a breakdown in a very prominent race like the Triple Crown or the San Nita Derby or something like that. So we don't really know, you know, what, what the mindset of these people is right now. Um, and, you know, I, I still worry that they will not ever accept the fact that horses break down in horse racing. And if that's the case, then this is not going away. No, and it's never going to go away fully. The, the idea should be to give them less fodder for that and for, and for their, you know, ex extremist, sensationalist press releases, which ultimately make their way into the news a lot. I think, yeah, I think you're right that there will always be opponents of racing now. And it's Pandora's box has been open. Especially, I think, in California, now that these people are in, we asked Greg Ferraro about this, now that these people are in these CHRB meetings, like, you have let them in the, within the castle, and now they're going to be part of the decision-making process, whether you like it or not, especially in California. So this, this you're right, Bill, that this is something that is never going to go away fully. And honestly, like, I don't even know that it should, because I think there should be so I'm not I'm not a PETA fan, obviously, and I think they, they take it way too far. But I think it does help to have an outside watchdog on racing because racing has had the opportunity to police itself for decades now and has done a piss poor job of it, in my opinion. So I think that while I would not side with the PETA people on anything and I obviously don't want racing to go away, I think that, you know, having some kind of outside watchdog can be beneficial to the sport to keep people honest because there's been a lot of complacency in racing for a long time. And I, I don't see that anymore. And I think you have to credit that at least in part to PETA and to the animal rights activists who have pushed them, you know, they, they, like I said, they go too far and they're extreme, but this is, I think racing has responded in the right way to it, at least so far. Again, excellent points, Joe. And I just want to add one more thing to it. Look, I mean, we, everybody hates PETA in horse racing and with good reason, but to go back to what they've had to say from day one when this started, if they've ever once called for the ban of horse racing, I miss that. I don't think believe they ever have. What they have said is fix all the problems. So, you know, put that into context that, you know, it goes back to what you're saying. You know, it makes me sick in the stomach to say something nice about them. But perhaps their pressure that they put on racing, whether we liked it or not, will help the sport out in the long run and please send your hate mail right to Joe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> send, uh, Brian's not here. Send it to Brian right, DiDonato, care of the Thoroughbred <laughs> Daily News, uh, 123 uh, Broad Street, Red Bank, New Jersey, 0770. Brian Hart's PETA. That's yes. What yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> but yeah, I think, I think the main point is that this is going to be a, a continuing issue, especially at Santa Anita. And, you know, it, ha so it has to be like an ongoing commitment throughout the industry and, and, comprehensive too, you know, whether it means making the track safer, being a super track superintendent's only priority. Cause like I said before, I, they used to speed up these tracks on these big days. And I think, think that was very short sighted. And I think safety has to be the only priority when it comes to managing a track, you know, you might have to install synthetic tracks in places that have consistent issues, rooting out cheaters, you know, even if they're big names with lots of horses, you know, there are some tracks, I'm not going to name any names, but there are definitely some tracks who, it seems more lenient on guys and don't bust them because they fill stalls. And I can understand, I can understand that motivation, but again, this is, this is a broad scope issue. And, you know, you talk about like the way, you know, business as usual in racing, what happens now if a trainer gets suspended? Well, he's runs his horses in his assistant's name and they run it, they win at the same percentage and he comes back in two weeks, like nothing happened. So to me, that kind of stuff has, has got to stop too. This has got to be, there's, there's got to be real consequences for cheating, for breaking down horses, and for treating them like total commodities and getting rid of them. And I think that's going to that's gonna have to be an industry-wide effort because there are so many splinter groups and so many different tracks in different dirt jurisdictions that it's easier for one track to kick a guy off the ground than it is for another track. But hopefully with the Thoroughbred Safety Coalition and a little bit more cooperation, we can start taking these issues more seriously. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting tax consulting and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. More than 500 clients in the horse business, they were bred to save you money. For more information on how they can help you, visit www.greenco.com. That's G -R -E -E -N -C -O dot com. Peter Brand is our guest this week as the Green Group Guest of the Week. And Peter, first of all, thanks for joining us. And you made some news this week with the announcement that Sister Charlie will return next year for a six-year-old campaign, the 2018 Eclipse Award winner. And tell us why you and Chad and the whole team decided to bring her back for another tilt in 2020. Uh, well, she you know, basically 
has only run 15 or 16 times, and um, you know she is a very special horse, at least in my lifetime, uh, most special horse. So, so um, I figured the chances of getting another one and that's sound and ready to race another year, uh, you know, it's just not not going to come along very very often and if ever again. So. Uh, I just uh, decided that that's what I wanted to do. You know, I think um, everybody enjoys watching her run, and most of all me. So I, I, I guess uh, it was just a decision that I made with you know my family and and uh, with Chad, and, and we're very delighted that she's going to be around for another year. Hopefully, she does very well. Thanks, Peter. It, it, it's Jonathan Green. Good to talk to you again. Good to, good to talk to you. Um, quick question for you. You know, over the when when you came back into the business in in you know a few years ago, it seems like one of your key strategies was to purchase horses from overseas. Um, Sister Charlie being one of them. What you know led you to buy a horse like her um, and have an understanding that her success in Europe would translate here? You know, so uh, predominantly. When I was in horse racing before for. You know, approximately 20 years. I, um, you know, I, I I bought horses in Europe as well. I mean, I think I, the first mare that I bought was uh, a mare called Coiffure, a northern, you know, a, a sort of Gaylord mare that had uh, run over there and uh, brought her over here. You know, sent her to Claiborne, and you know, I I bred her to uh, Northern Dancer, and you know, got an American horse who was. Uh, won the Alabama. I've always been fortunate to buy some of the European uh, blood or some American blood that had gone over and, and run well in, uh, in Europe. You know, I, I think that the percentages for me were very good. So, uh, and I, I like the idea, you know, I like the way they trained over there, you know, young horse. I, I particularly like Sister Charlie because she had, you know, great turn of foot and, uh, and quickened, you know, really nicely there, and you know, it run around two turns there, and you know, I thought she would be, uh, she would be good. That being said, you know, most of them do not want to go like that, <laughs> right. but uh, uh, she was, you know, very special. And I, I had purchased uh, Wea, who was also a horse that was over there, and and uh, you know, Wea was uh, by far away son, and she. Um, she was uh, very successful at uh, three in, in Europe, and then we, and then the Wildensteins brought her over here. She did very well. I purchased them from her from uh, them, and uh, you know she became a champion, and and she uh, was a champion on the dirt. And then she produced uh, some very very nice horses. Uh, I had a two year old, a great two year old, uh, Colt De Niro. Unfortunately, uh, his career. You know, ended with a, you know, with an injury, but uh, he was a super two-year-old on the dirt. So I, I you know, I, I don't think necessarily grass horses, dirt horses. You know, the blood. Uh, the Europeans have uh, purchased so much of the great American blood and brought brought it over there, and have stallions over there that represent that blood. You know, I don't think there's anything wrong with bringing some of it back. Right, and, and and you mentioned uh, you know buying European horses, and and I know you've made um, a headline this week as well buying unaided, um, who uh, you know over in Europe, who is the dam of the Breeders' Cup winner uh, Uni, um, in fall to a phenomenal worldwide stallion, known they never. What was the thinking behind buying that uh, brood mare? Um, you know, who has a daughter who was in direct competition with you for the, uh, you know, in the grade one races you've run in and, and probably for the Eclipse Award? Yeah, I mean, uh, that didn't have, I mean, the only way that that had anything to do with it is, I've, you know, I've been obviously around uh, Uni a, a lot being in the same barn and I've always had a lot of respect for her as, a, you know, as a great, you know, great miler and uh, she, um the dams, you know, particularly goes a little deeper than that. Uh, is by Dan Zilly. I think Dan Zilly is going to be a really good broodmare sire. Uh, that's my opinion. I mean, it doesn't mean that that has to be. But I, I'm, you know, betting on Dan Zilly. I think uh, I've had a number of other Dan Zilly mares, classic Dane Hill cross, and um, we that crosses with many different sire lines. Uh, you know, including the 
Galileo line and the Dubawi line, and obviously the more than ready line. Uh, Peter, getting back to Sister Charlie, the irony of it uh, is that Uni coming out of the same barn, and again, as you mentioned, uh, you know, being around her and seeing her is probably your main competition for the Eclipse Award. But it got Stormy is another horse that has the uh, bona fides to get a lot of Eclipse Award votes. So you're not a voter. You're obviously not unbiased. But why don't you give us your take on why you believe Sister Charlie should repeat this year as the Philly and Mayor Grass champion? Well, you know, I'd rather not because it's up to really up to people to vote to, to give their vote of what they think. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm more in the, you know, range of classic horses, you know, so I, I look at really horses that are, you know, one turn mile and an eighth horses or mile and a sixteenth horses or mile and a quarter horses. Uh, those, you know, that's to me where, um, you know, when I'm breeding, that's what I look, that's what I look to get. Now, if you buy a mile or, uh, or a seven eighths of a mile horse or a three quarter of a mile horse and you breed it to a horse that, you know, you want to put more speed into, then it's, it's, it's good for your breeding program. But since we have so much speed over here, I basically look to, you know, mares that are, uh, more two turn horses. And Peter, touching on that theme and, and some of the things you just said, in your first go in horse racing, you had a lot of success on the turf, but you also had some very good dirt horses. Gold Track Baron uh, come to mind right off the, the top of my head. There were others, Mogambo. This time around, most of your successes come on the grass, which has something to do, of course, with being affiliated with Chad Brown, who was a very good trainer in all aspects, but he's so darn good in grass. Do you still look to get that next great three-year-old, that next great horse on the dirt who might put the Peter Brandt Silks into the winner's circle in the Kentucky Derby? Well, what do you think? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> obviously, obviously, I live uh, over here and I uh, race over here. And, uh, you know, we've been fortunate. I mean, we have, you know, a horse like uh, Dunbar Road, who, you know, won the Alabama and is a very high-class uh, horse. And then we had, you know, Pacific Wind, who started off as a as a turf horse and was moved over to the dirt. And then, of course, Wildcat, who was a turf horse, who was second in the Breeders' Cup. I think that it, it, it's only because of sort of how I entered and how, you know, I really kind of was focusing on the Wildenstein blood at the very beginning when that, that dispersal took place. I have great respect for the way they bred horses and raced horses over, you know, a 40, 50-year period. And um, I think that blood's very, very good, but a lot of people, you know, were not, did not consider that that fashionable at the time because it, they hadn't had a lot of really good horses more recently. That's for the reason that it started, and, and I also was a believer that, the, that there were many great stallions over there, and I really, you know, I really wanted to breed to those stallions. Uh, so I think what we're trying to do is you know, is race and breed uh, really good horses. Don't don't really care whether it's on the dirt or the grass. I mean, I get just as much excitement winning a great turf race as I do uh, a great dirt race. Uh, I can assure you, when you're, you know, if you run a horse in the Arc de Triomphe, it's, you know, it's like running a horse in the Derby. You know, it's really a great honor to have a horse in there that's that can compete, and it's great racing. So. Uh, I'd, I'd love to, you know, there's nothing, I mean, I'd, nothing I'd rather do than win the Kentucky Derby. I was lucky once to be a part of a, a great horse, Swale, that won, and it was, a, you know, a thrill of a lifetime, and won the Breeders' Cup with uh, with Gulch, and that was, you know, with Wayne Lucas training him, and that was a great, uh, great uh, day. Um, I, you know, I like the dirt racing just as much, but I do believe that, I do believe that grass racing is an important part of the racing here, and you know, I I think that it's going to become a more important part. I want to, you know, I want to be active in that side too, but I'm not focusing just on turf. And again, it might it might seem that way because the running horses that I bought really came from Europe, you know, brought them over here. And, and you've had some great success not only buying top um, bloodlines and 
um, having the top trainers like Chad Brown campaign them. But recently, you also purchased one of the premier training facilities in Florida, Payson Park. Can you give us a little bit of background on uh, on why that was, uh, you know, a, a purchase for you, and also maybe some of the upgrades that have uh, that you're implementing in that uh, wonderful training facility? Primarily because I, I knew it uh, from being, you know, from. Uh, Having horses with Leroy Jolly, you know, when I first got into racing, I had my horses with uh, Frank and David Whiteley, and they brought the horses to uh, to Camden, South Carolina. Uh, and I, you know, I noticed uh, that you know they'd be missing some days there, and and then when I went with uh, you know because of the weather, and when I went with Leroy, he was taking these horses, uh, coming up with really good two-year-olds, and going to Payson Park. I think it's mostly because the track is is especially good there, and um, it's uh, you know it's it's more favorable to a horse's legs. It has a very good base, natural base, and um, I had real success uh, training. You know, having Leroy train those horses at Payson Park, and they would come out running. I mean, we we had you know so many good two-year-olds, uh, horses like Gulch and. Magambo and you know Craig Barron and horses like that that were dirt horses and and I think that's the primary uh, you know reason I also have horses at Palmetto which is an you know excellent facility as well but uh, some horses are, you know don't favor that track you know, they they do better at Basin so uh, I try to you know have them in both and then they do have the turf there we you know we haven't improved that turf course. Uh, a lot put you know rails up and new uh, cutting equipment and uh, new you know harrows for the racetrack for the dirt track. You know we we think it's a great uh, training facility. Uh, you know I, I I knew George Oliver very well and he he uh, was part of building that along with Michael Phipps and Mr. Chenery and and Bull Hancock. So so it's got such a great history and it, you know. It got a little run down, but uh, nothing that some, you know, tender care can't uh, improve. And we've worked on the on the quarters for the, you know, for the uh, the grooms, people that are living uh, there that work at uh, that patient. So uh, we've improved that, and we're starting to improve some of the barns. And you know, hopefully, we're, our 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 goal is to make it a cooperative to the trainers that are there and we're, you know, we're working on that and, and think that's the best future for it. Peter, before we let you go, uh, last question and a horse that we need to touch on. Um, you had a horse that you campaigned this year that we really didn't get to know how good he was. And that's D Marshallet, who was three for three going into the Belmont Derby and then got injured in that race and was pulled up. Uh, that's the bad news. The good news is he is going to be a stallion next year. Uh, and, uh, certainly has a lot of credentials to think that he could be a terrific stallion. So first of all, uh, you know, tackle both subjects. How disappointing was it that, that that horse wasn't able to continue his campaign and, and how bullish are you on him as a stallion? Well, I, yeah, I was, you know, I was very uh, disappointed because he was, you know, one of my, my very favorite horses. Uh, and, you know, he was, he was by Dubowie out of a great mare and, you know, spectacular looking horse. And he was one of the horses we bought over at Tattersall's and brought over here as a young horse too. And, you know, he started out as a rising star and he, he um, went to Keeneland and won very impressively, and then he, you know, he won the Penine Ridge here as a prep for the Belmont, uh, the Belmont uh, Derby, and you know he just put his, you know, foot down in the wrong place and and uh, had to be pulled up, and glad that we could just save him, and uh, we had uh, the you know, we sent him over to the Ruffy, and they did a phenomenal job with him, and I just asked the. The guys at uh, Claiborne, I mean Bernie Sams and Seth and Walker, you know, to to uh, consider you know this horse because he he was very special, and I think they they knew that I I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't want to stand a horse that I didn't really think had you know spectacular uh, ability. And uh, Chad, you know, he was he was our real hope for the for the year. So uh, on you know the on the turf and, and, uh, thought it would be really good to stand him and, and Claiborne 
kind of embraced that idea, and they they were very uh, cooperative, and they really you know made a big effort to to make it work, and and um, I couldn't be happier. I mean, it's a great farm to have a horse standing, and I hope he does well. I know I'm supporting him. I'm you know breeding a number of mares to him. I'm breeding like you know 14 mares to him. Well, Peter, very good. Thank you so much for spending some time with us here as the Green Group Guest of the Week on the TDN Writers Podcast. Best of luck with Sister Charlie in 2020. Best of luck with the entire stable. And once again, thanks so much for your insights and your time. Thank you very much. Thanks for calling. Thank you, Peter. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting tax consulting advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As The Green Group Guest of the Week, Peter Brandt will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. The Green Group, bred to save you money. For more information on how they can help you, visit www.greenco.com. One of the things I wanted to do, uh, since this is my last show of the year, um, is looking forward to 2020, I wanted to kind of run down some horses that we're looking at and looking for big things from in the future, in some circumstances, at least in the one I picked, if they can stay healthy, because I think those are usually some of the horses that, you know, you think have untapped potential, the horses that have had physical issues. Uh, we're we're going to exclude two-year-olds from this just because I feel like once the calendar turns, it's going to be basically derby season and we're going to be talking and discussing and bandying about these horses ad nauseum until the first Saturday in May. So we'll exclude those for the time being. My horse is a three-year-old about to be four-year-old complexity. He is a TDN rising star. He's by McLean's music and he had a scintillating debut win at Saratoga last summer, then ran in the champagne and really ran a bang up race. He, he set a really fast pace. I think won by about four and three quarter lengths Never showed any signs of stopping. Second in that race, clear second in that race, was Code of Honor, who turned out to be an okay three-year-old. And Complexity then ran in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile and, you know, set up when I was on a pretty fast pace and eventually got buried in there and just didn't seem like himself that day. He then was off for a long time and returned in the Woody Stevens in June and again was on a supersonic pace. Maybe it maybe was the fastest pace of the year in racing. Um, and I think that happens a lot in the Woody Stevens, honestly. It makes a lot of sense that these horses that are too fast for their own good to be on the Derby Trail or the Triple Crown Trail will cut back, and then they'll all fry each other's eyeballs out in the Woody, Woody Stevens. So that's kind of what happened to Complexity as well in the Woody Stevens. So again, he then went on the shelf and returned last month at Aqueduct and ran in an allowance race. It was a pretty decent race. Um, he was kind of dead on the board, honestly. He was like 3-2 to two or 8-5. to five. I think he was even money uh, on the morning line and could not have been more impressive mainly because he sat off the speed, which he had never done before. He'd always gone to the front and sat off the speed professionally, had this perfect little inside-out trip under Jose Ortiz and blew them away in the stretch. I think one by about 10 or 12 lengths. I didn't see what buyer number he got. It had to be in the high 90s at least because it was a track that was playing pretty dull. It, he stopped the clock in like 122 and 3. I think uh, there, there hadn't been – I hadn't seen a sub-124, 7 for a long split at Aqueduct all meet. So that's one I'm looking forward to, Klarovich, Chad Brown. So he's got top connections on his side. And I think, like I said, the idea that he can now rate, I think he has the potential, if healthy, to be a total monster going seven furlongs to a one-term mile in 2020. He's, he's a horse I'd have an eye out for the Met mile. I haven't seen what he's pointing to next. I assume maybe one of the Gulfstream sprint races, unless unless there was some issue, another health issue that I'm not aware of. But that's one I thought that was a little bit under the radar because he was really exciting as a two-year-old. He's a grade one winner as a two-year-old and really fell off the map after those two non-efforts over the span of like six months. So I hope that he can stay healthy, build on that allowance win, and I'm looking forward to seeing him hopefully in the Met Mile in 2020. Two works at uh, Palmetto's, by the way, since... December, since early December, and does have an entry for the Malibu. My man. So, there we go. There you Possible. Go. All right. You are Possible on Possible you see him again this year. Managing editor slash research <laughs> assistant, Al Carrasso. <laughs> uh, thank you, man. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that'll be a good battle if he makes it, him in Omaha Beach. I think that'd be fun. So, uh, yeah, we're gonna, we'll are gonna we get proven. Uh, I'll get proven right or wrong pretty quickly on that one. <laughs> see if he, he can hang with the grade one three-year-olds this late in the year. I'm going to try to think a little bit outside the box as well. And how about Monomoy Girl? Coming back, missed all of 2019, and we saw what Midnight Bisu was able to do in her absence. We also saw in 2018 that Monomoy Girl had Midnight Bisu's number, no doubt about it. So the question is, did Midnight Bisu get a lot better, 
Or is Monomoy Girl so good that she was able to trounce a horse that had a possible Horse of the Year campaign in 2019 and will win an Eclipse Award? I can't wait to see her come back to the races. I hope she stays healthy. And, you know, I love showdowns in, in horse racing. And if we get, you know, at Saratoga or something like that, Monomoy Girl and Midnight Bisu meeting each other once again, uh, and both horses are healthy, boy, I mean, that's a race I really want to see. So, you know, they, they, they lost a lot of time with her. They lost an entire year, but she is coming back. And again, it's one of those horses, like you said, Joe, with your horse complexity that, you know, people, you know, just tend to forget about these horses. Well, let's remember how good she was. And I hope to see her back soon. Maybe uh, something like the apple blossom, perhaps um, we'll find out and uh, want to see what uh, she can do vis-a-vis Midnight Beast. So I think it's going to be a fascinating story in 2020. It's really interesting that she took the entire year off and is still coming back as a five-year-old. I think you don't often see things like that. If a horse goes on a shelf for that long and is has any kind of value, residual value, they usually get sold and retired. So yeah, that's a good one. You know, Bill, I agree with you. The, the Philly side is always so much more exciting when they continue on racing and uh, and, and, and they go on and, and run during their three and four and five year campaign. Um, and in that same vein, there's a Philly that I was really excited about watching, Garana, um, who's a ghost zapper, a homebred of three chimneys, won very impressively first time out, then, you know, demolished a, a very good field in the acorn, went from maiden special weight right to a grade one, won that impressively, came back and you could say maybe she bounced, but she still went wire to wire in another grade one, the coaching club American. Um, they gave her a little bit of time and then she ran uh, kind of a, you know, an okay race in the cotillion. And then finally, you know, realized that uh, she had a couple of ailments and they were giving her a little time off, but the ghost sappers are always later developing. I think he himself really didn't blossom until he was a four year old. Um, and to see a Philly of this caliber, you know, start up that, that uh, precociously and that early in, in her career is really exciting. So that's a Philly Garana that I'm looking forward to watching in 2020. Don't know that this is under the radar. I'm sure she's not under the radar, but I'm looking forward to seeing Concrete Rose back in, in 2020. Um, I think she had a really, um, how do we say, underrated or or underappreciated campaign in, in, uh, in 2019. Uh, one that Edgewood, and really, I, I mean, she was one of the more – dominating uh, fillies of her class, really. I mean, when, when you take into account, she was doing her thing on the grass, but she won the uh, Florida Oaks, won the Edgewood, uh, beat Newspaper of Record, who was everybody's great thing at that point. When she won the um, the Belmont Oaks, she was beating Just Wonderful, a uh, Bally Doyle filly who's gone, who went on to, to place in, in, uh, in Group 1 company, was just behind Iridesa, who won the British Cup filly in her turf. And then uh, her her final race, uh, she blew them away in the uh, in the Saratoga Oaks. So Rusty Arnold uh, put her away with a little minor ailment, and is going to bring her back slowly. But I think she can be uh, maybe she can challenge the likes of Sister Charlie in the, in that division next year. Yeah, two two special affiliates. I would, I would totally agree with you guys. So one last thing before we get out of here, I think thought this would be a, a little fun retrospective, you know, on the year. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's been a tumultuous year in racing, but, you know, we forget sometimes that there is a lot of great racing and a lot of great drama happening, you know, on a, almost on a daily basis in this sport. And that's what keeps, he keeps us coming back, you know, especially at the top of the game when these horses hook up in big races. And I wanted to go around the room and give our race of the year, um, opinions from 2019. I think, I think there were a lot of good ones to, choose from and we'll play a little snippet of the race call to kind of take you guys back and so you can reminisce along with us on some of the great races in a year that was tough a year was really tough for racing but in the at the end of the day when they get on the track and when these top horses go at it you know it's it's the the drama and the excitement really is second to none for me and i think uh, i speak for a lot of racing fans so i think before we sign off and before we uh, we head into 2020, I, I'd like to relive some of these moments of the 2019 racing year. So my race is going to be overseas, which is a little surprising since I'm not a huge Euro and worldwide racing fan. That's usually Al's department. And it's a little more surprising that I picked this one and he didn't. But to me, it was the race of the year, um, you know, on a global scale. This was at Ascot and it was 
Enable, who I think is widely respected and revered as the best racehorse in the world, and Crystal Ocean, who's one of the top males, if not the top male in Europe. And they hooked up at the top of the stretch in the King George and just duked it out nose and nose all the way down to the line. It was just a scintillating race. So let's play a little bit of that call for you. It's always good when the announcer's <laughs> voice cracks. That's how you know it's a great race. And a great race call, great too. Call. Who, who was that? Ian Bartlett. Ian Bartlett. That was a terrific call of a terrific race. And I love, you know, this is one of the things that, that I think European racing does much better than American racing in terms of the presentation. I love that little tracking shot on the inside rail. I think is so cool, and I wish more American tracks would do that. And that's one. I know it it's defeats the purpose. You can't really see it. You can hear it. If you go and look, watch that race on YouTube, wait until they go to the inside rail view. It is absolutely epic. You can basically feel the horse's breath. Like, that's how close you are. And just an absolutely incredible battle. And, you know, hats off to Enable. Hats off to both of them for a great show. Um, you know, there were m many memorable individual performances this year, thinking of the likes of Imperial Hint up at Saratoga, Chance Lot up at, in, at the spa as well. But for me, the race of the year was the Met Mile, uh, which takes place on what I feel is the second best day of racing in, in this country every year. Uh, Belmont Stakes Day with that um, aggregation of grade one races has just become a, a must-see event. But, you know, in the race you had uh, Mitoli, who, uh, crazy enough, I mean, I guess hindsight's twenty twenty, but he was 7-2 to two Yo, that day, which is kind of Overlay nuts. of the year, honestly. Um, McKinsey was in from California as the 8-5 to five favorite. Thunder Snow was making a start off the Dubai World Cup in the same race. You had Cole Front, who, who was very powerful, winning the Godolphin Mile. Uh, great Warner's promises fulfilled Forensi Fire. So top to bottom is really a great field in, in what's become a great race. And I, I wasn't completely on board the Matoli bandwagon at, at that point, but he really showed me something that day, uh, you know, sitting up on that pace, uh, 44 and a tick to the half mile. And then out finishing McKinsey, who was um, admittedly unlucky, but um, – I guess I'm not in in the corner of those that said he he ran a winning race. Uh, Thunder Snow was beaten a, a neck further back in third. So great race for me. So here it is, the last furlong and a half or so of the Run Happy Metropolitan Handicap. Snow moves between horses. Ferenze Fire is there. McKenzie has no place to go. He's in traffic with a furlong to run. And Matoli to catch. Here's Thunder Snow coming through an opening on the inside. McKenzie with a late path. But it's Matoli. He did it again. Matoli wins the run happy mid mile. It was McKinsey second. Then Thunder Snow and promises fulfilled. The final time was 132.75. Yeah, they were really moving. Yeah, and just, you know, that to me, you know, obviously he won the British Cup sprint and he won a couple other great ones. To me, that's the defining performance of a championship season for Matoli. Because like you said, that was build even beforehand as the race of the year and it, it didn't disappoint i'm going to go with a little more obvious uh, race which was the breeders cup distaff um that recently uh ran at, at santa anita um and, and it's not even so much that the race itself was was that enthralling or exciting it was the field that it was amassed in that race i don't remember seeing too often where nine out of 11 entries are grade one winners going into a race. Um, so top to bottom, the race was stacked. And even though the race had all of those grade one winners, you know, the proverbial favorite was Midnight Bizu. Um, it was six to five, and everyone expected her to, to run well. And the reason why I, I picked this race, you know, again, there was depth of field. Um, it was a lot of money they were running for. Serengeti Empress ran right up to the front, and everyone thought, okay, this is uh, you know, going to be a repeat of, of some of her other great races of the year where she goes on top and, and keeps going. And all of a sudden, out of the, out of the clouds, you have um, you know, Blue Prize come out and run down Serengeti Empress and run all the way to the, to the finish and, and win the race. 
And it was really exciting for me personally, not only because it was a great race, but also because a local guy, Jersey Joe Bravo, won his first Breeders' Cup race. And he did it because he out jumped Midnight Biso. He basically took his filly and, and said, now's my chance. I have to get up there before Midnight comes from way back. Um, and he basically out jockeyed the top race or, the race riders in the country in that race um, and basically, uh, you know, got the win because of his decision making. So it was wonderful for me on a lot of levels because we had run against a bunch of the Phillies in the races. Um, you know, Jersey Joe, you know, won a race and, and we're good friends with, with Joe Bravo and, and has been excited about his career. Um, but also as a self-serving quiet brag, I picked the winner and also picked the exact uh, <laughs> um, right here on the show on, on October 30th. That's why John so brought it that's up. That's why his, I really his, brought it his up. His one good opinion of the year. That he was had, it. That was it. it. I, don't, I don't have Bill Finley complimenting me like I do, you know, you, Joe. So I, I don't know what you gave him at the Christmas party in, in terms of, of bribes. But, um, but yes, it, so, so it, was a, it was a humble brag, you know, that uh, as to why I picked this race as well. Blue Prize is coming three wide. Mosi Cal cuts the corner. Midnight Bizu, fifth at the top of the stretch. And here she comes on the far outside. Saren getting up for us to the eighth pole. Blue Prize, here's Midnight Bizu. Blue Prize strikes the front. Midnight Bizu is closing on the outside. Blue Prize has it though, close to home. And it's going to be Blue Prize and John Bravo to win the Breeders' Cup this staff. I said earlier on the podcast how much I like showdowns in racing. When two horses, good horses, look each other in the eye and it really comes down to nothing more than who is the best horse. We see so little of that in horse racing because top horses try to duck one another. They only run four or five times a year. But we got it this year in the personal ends in Saratoga. And Midnight Bisu came out on top of that. But she had to run her you-know-what off to be able to beat a late, the Belmont horse. And, you know, probably the distance helped her because a late loves a mile and a quarter, Midnight Bisu loves a mile and eighth. But that was the type of race that, you know, literally could make, give you goosebumps. And, you know, it's all well and fine when a horse goes off and wins by five lengths in a great performance, but that's not nearly as exciting as something like the personal incident is to me. And again, you're talking about great excitement, Saratoga, the level of these two horses, how good they were. That, to me, was the race and of the year. the lead is two as they make their way to the top of the stretch. And now a late makes her move for the lead. And Midnight Bisu comes blasting on the outside after her. These two will turn for home together. Coach Rox has faded to third. She's a Julian Wildcat on the inside. They're into the stretch. And it's a late to catch. Midnight Bisu, her fearsome foe, comes at her on the outside. And these two lay it on the line with a 16th to go. A late on the inside. Midnight Bisu on the outside. They're coming to the wire. Who's it going to be? Oh, <laughs> it's so close. It's so close. Was it Midnight Bizu or was it a late? They were inseparable on the wire. All right, so that's it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room. I want to thank everybody, all the listeners, for you know giving us a shot in, in, in this space. And I think it's it's been a constructive it's been a constructive discussion on a weekly basis at a time that is really a crisis point for racing. My hope is that it helps all of us, you know, listeners, us in the studio. I hope it helps everybody kind of deal with these issues that are so important in racing right now. And, you know, it's, it's a tough time, but I think if we all put our heads together, we can come out in a better place for racing in 2020 and beyond. And I hope that we have done our little part of that so far. And I look forward to many more constructive discussions in 2020 and Bill Finley telling me how great I am. And <laughs> it's, it's, it's really productive. That's a, that's especially, but no, seriously, I, I, I want to thank everybody for listening. And I also want to thank everybody behind the scenes who has done such a great job with this editing and piecing it together. I want to thank Nathan Wilkinson, our editor, Patty Wolf, who's like our guru, who is, has, has spearheaded this thing along with our publisher, Sue Finley, Anthony LaRue, Rocka, Pat, Patty's right hand man as well. Um, I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, Alan Carrasso, this week's Green Group, Yes of the Week, Peter Brandt. I want to thank Brian DiDonato, Steve Chirac, everybody who's been on the podcast so far this year, all of our guests. Uh, I want to thank the Green Group for their sponsorship and hopefully better, bigger and better things coming in 2020. And I couldn't be prouder and more excited about the work that we've done here so far. And I hope you guys have enjoyed it. And I hope you keep listening. And I hope everybody has a Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Holidays, all that good stuff. And I will see you in 2020. Thank you for listening. 